please welcome Wayne Knight. Hey fans, this panel recording was sponsored by those great people at 80stees.com. And whether you're a fan of Seinfeld, Jurassic Park, or just love Wayne Knight, they have some shirts that are sure to please. And if you use coupon code FSNight, you'll get 30% off your next order. Visit 80stees.com today. Now, it's go time. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming out. This is really wonderful to have you here. Well, thanks. I got a question before we get to the audience. Um, I've heard that before you got into acting, you were a private investigator. Not before I got into acting. Um, you know, whenever you start out in the business, I went to New York instead of to L.A. to start. So you start waiting tables, you know, and doing my... And I had a friend who used to wait tables, and he says, no, I got a better job. I go, yeah, what do you do? He goes, I'm a private investigator. I said, how the hell do you get that job? You don't have any criminology experience, and you're not very bright. He goes, <laughs> yes, but I'm an actor. And I go, what does that do for you? He goes, well, these people like hiring actors because they have no scruples. They're willing to misrepresent themselves, and they're not upwardly mobile. They only want to work part-time. I said, fantastic. So for five years, I worked as a private investigator in between acting jobs. I would go do a job and come back and work as a private eye. Because I had a desk, I could see the Empire State Building, and I had a fake name. Uh, as, a, as a detective, I was Bill Monty. <laughs> uh, originally, I, I, uh, it was um, Harry Paris, Tom Rome, Bill London, you know, and they, they went, no, no, no. So I took my father's first name and my mother's maiden name, and I used that as my detective name. and. Uh, it helped me later on in the lying straight to people's faces. <laughs> <laughs> so it was like, uh, were you like trailing people? And Sometimes. I mean, I remember one time uh, I, I was uh, following this girl into uh, Red Hook in Brooklyn, and it was a rainy night in February, and there was a three-legged dog that just walked by as I'm standing under a street lamp, and I thought, this may not be the job for me. <laughs> it just didn't seem to work out. Did you want to get some questions from the audience? I hope so. Good. Let's start right down front. Nice game, pretty boy. Oh, well, thank uh, you. What Seinfeld spoof was better of your movies, JFK, uh, The Boyfriend, or The Package with Basic Instinct? And have you seen Schindler's List lately? Uh, not this week. <laughs> um, but... Um, it's one of those movies that you don't like see over and over again to get that feel good thing going. Um, but um, I think that um, the perfect thing was the second spitter because we had a, a writer on Seinfeld at the time, Tom Leopold, who was a big JFK uh, assassination buff. And he went and saw JFK. And he came back to Jerry and he says, do you, do you realize that Wayne Knight is in JFK playing a character named Numa. His name was, the real guy's name was Numa Bertel. Mm -hmm. So that's when the second spitter thing happened and, and we did the reenactment and it was like, it was too perfect. That to me was perfect. Um, this guy's gonna stand up, so. What do you like more being in Dress Park or Space Jam? Uh, both of them were miserable experiences <laughs> uh, for two different reasons. Um, Jurassic Park, because I was, I was as fat as humanly possible. I was soaking wet during most of it. And people were shooting me in the face with dyed black KY jelly. <laughs> and I was falling down waterfalls and I'm falling down and I ripped my leg open. And I, but the results of that were quite good. Now, a Space Jam, there were no actors to be seen for miles. The, uh, you're in a soundstage that's only green screen with little red uh, uh, tennis balls on the wall. And the actors you're dealing with are uh, improv actors who are wearing green ninja suits and they're on their knees and their faces are covered. And you're speaking to them as if they're cartoon characters. There are no other actors. You're just making it up in your head. So you just kind of make believe, you know, the whole time. It's a bizarre experience. But it was good. It was good. They're all weird. Let's go to that side of the room over there. 
Sure. Uh, just uh, staying on Space Jam, I mean, you've worked with a lot of huge names over the years. Is there a bigger name than Michael Jordan? I mean, at that time, his no, biggest no. superstardom. I don't think so. I, I mean, well, it depends on where you go. Like, working with Kevin Costner during JFK, we were uh, in New Orleans, and we went into Tipitina's, which at the time was like a classic place for music. Everybody's standing there with long neck bottles of beer facing the stage, and the music is playing. He walked in the back of the place. It was a room like this. Within about 10 seconds, the entire room turned around and was looking at him, and he had to leave. You know, so fame comes in waves, you know? But Michael Jordan's fame was so permanent and so warranted <laughs> that that was pretty good. Okay. Uh, right here. One of the roles I really love is Al in Toy Story 2. Was that yeah. fun to do? Just you know, it was weird. I was doing a play in New York at the time, and um, I would go into a studio. John Lasseter would get on a screen, and they would show me, you know, visuals from the movie, and I, I was doing it long distance. I never did it uh, at the studio. I always did it from New York. But, uh, yeah, you know, Al, is, Al gets into the, the deep nasty. <laughs> so, yeah, he was fun. We have a question right down here. Yes. And Wayne, if you could put your microphone a little closer, that'd be Sorry, good. sorry. No, that's, we're good. <laughs> Some of your more popular roles tend to be somewhat malevolent. Yes. Um, is that something you've sought out, or is that something that's been sought out from, I, from I you? I think that what happens is, when you're a fat guy, you're either an idiot or, or uh, an evil guy. You know, I mean, there has to be some reason why you've gotten this way. <laughs> something nasty. Uh, and also, if you become popular in anything, it's very difficult to shake that. So I think that um, once Newman took place, that's that. You know, the likelihood of me playing somebody's lovable grandfather, minimal. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we probably have a two-part question right here. Yeah. All right, hello, Wayne. Great to have you with us. Thank you. So my two-part question is, which... Um, uh, um, both uh, live action and like animation, which parts do you enjoy the most about those? And the second is, which movie moment do you look back on on the one that you're the most proud of? Hmm. Yeah, that's a hard one. Um, as far as animation versus live action, animation is a lot of fun to do, and it's strangely taxing. Because when you go in to do like a feature film, um, like uh, going to do, you know, uh, close, get close. The problem is it's so poppy when it's here and it's dead here. I'll try to find the exact right spot. Um, now when you do animation, you have to do the entire film in one session. So you're acting all parts of the movie and then you come back and do session after session after session as they do rewrites because they need to have your voice married to the other characters to see how it sounds. Um, and you don't get paid very well for animation because you're a voice artist and the art is really the star. Uh, and film acting is totally different deal, but it's messy. <laughs> we'll go back there and then come back up. Who did you, uh, enjoy with working on Jurassic? Who did you enjoy? Like working with on. Um, uh, well, Park. you know, most of the time I was kind of the antagonist to the whole world, and I didn't have like a lot of byplay. Um, but my one experience yeah, from Jurassic Park was something I keep with me for a long time, which is I had lunch one day with Michael Crichton, and uh, got to speak to him at length about the internet and the future. And his thought, I said, what do you think of the ubiquitousness of the internet? And he says, I don't like it. And I said, why? He said, because you get great thought from rumination that Einstein sat on a porch and thought about things. He didn't seek out the thoughts of everyone else and consensus, that the internet is about consensus. It's not about individualized thought. I never even thought of something like that. And it was just wonderful to be able to have that experience. He happened to be at Amblin, uh, and we happened to have that lunch. So the whole experience of doing Jurassic Park, I didn't get cast. I got cast in Jurassic Park without ever auditioning. 
I had never met Steven Spielberg until I went to Hawaii to film my first scenes. I met him at the bottom of the gates of Jurassic Park. They drove me up through a mud road, a cane road on in the, this rainy part of Hawaii. And he's standing at the bottom of, of the thing. And I walk towards him. And I say, I hope I'm the one you wanted. And he says, you're the one. <laughs> Question right here. Hi, Wayne. Uh, do you have any good uh, Larry David stories or one good Larry David story? No, you know, the truth of the matter is, most of the time I was working with Larry, Larry scared the hell out of me. Uh, because his, his physicality is so relaxed. He's like just off the golf course, relaxed. But inside, he's not like that. So you don't quite know what's going on. And he's, he's powerful because he takes that power. He believes in his creativity, and he doesn't you know, brook any conversation. We had one day when uh, he just told the network, I'm not doing a run through. They went, what? I'm not doing a run through. And nobody else would do that except Larry David, but it's because he knew what he had. He's, he's a guy who, when he sees something funny and knows it's funny, it's funny. Is he thought to play Newman at one time? Larry? Yeah. Not I that read that as a room. Good. Uh, uh, no, uh, uh, he, th what happened was Newman was created without having been cast. And Larry did the voice oh. of Newman from the rooftop uh, when Newman was threatening to jump off the roof. Uh, and then they later, I came in and voiced it so that it would be Alpha Omega me. And then Larry's voice wasn't in it. I knew there was something. Let's head to the back of the room again. What's up? Um, I have to ask, has like any like random fan come up to you and just said like, hello, Newman or something? Today. Has anyone in this room not done that? <laughs> <laughs> OK, and right over here. Hello. <laughs> oh, see, he cut you off before you even got it out. Uh, see, I'm uh, quick. Uh, yeah. I just wanted to know, when you were voicing Evil Emperor Zerg for Buzz Lightyear Star Command, yes. were you in the same recording booth with Patrick Warburton? Uh, uh, at some times, but, not, but often not. Because when you do animation, you're, you're very seldom in the same room. The only time that, uh, if you're doing a strip show, like an animated show where all the characters join in a room, I did this thing, um, I played Dojo, this dragon in a, in a animated show, and we were all in the room together. Yeah, 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 for Challenge Showdown there was like Tom Kenny and, and Tara Strong and Gray Delisle and all these great voice artists. And um, the great benefit of being in something popular is that they allow you to do voice work every now and then as an interloper. And then eventually, if you do it well enough, you can feel like a voice artist. But it's a real skill. And uh, real people do it. And back here again. Hello, Newman. Hi, uh, hello. Yeah. That's too. Little Newman. What is your favorite episode of Seinfeld? Mine is the butter shave. What is yours? Oh, actually, uh, it's the second part of the ticket, uh, where uh, we go to court to defend uh, Kramer for uh, his uh, use of the uh, oh, radar detector and. And then we have a courtroom scene, and I, I'm uh, describing how, Newman, how uh, Kramer never became a banker. <laughs> and then lose my mind. It's the one time where I kind of improvisationally allowed myself to just go wild. And they kept it. And it was a lot of fun. And question back here. Uh, did you ever think Newman would become such an iconic figure that it became when you got cast for the show? No. Well, first of all, I, I got cast in a one-off. There was not any idea that this was going to become a, a recurring thing. And uh, it, it was in this episode where Jerry, uh, the, the, the question was, how long do you have to wait for a guy who's in a coma to hit on his girlfriend? <laughs> and uh, I, uh, as Newman, was the building snitch. And I was going to tell the guy in a coma when he woke up that Jerry had, had hit on his girlfriend. And he bought me off with a Drake's cake. So. They had uh, Michael and myself sitting next to each other in this hospital room. And the visual was such that they said, no, this is going to happen again. Because we looked like something out of the 1939 World's Fair. It was a tall thing and a big round thing. And it just kept going. Let's head over to that side of the room. Hey, thanks for coming. 
Sure. I'll never be able to stop thinking about, can I have 10,000 marbles, please, from Animal House? What did Animal House do to kickstart your career as Flounder? Well, actually nothing, because I didn't play that part. That is correct. That's Stephen first. That was Stephen first. <laughs> That's all right. But you know, early in my career, a lot of people mistook me for Stephen. And then Stephen lost weight before I ever did. And then they were mistaking him for me, and me for him. And you know, it's all right. Okay. <laughs> this leads me to something that's been, that kind of I want to mention. Um, this probably wasn't you, but I have this really strange photographic memory for comedy. Mm -hmm. In the 19, uh, probably late 70s, early 80s, there was a, a character that appeared on the Gong Show. Wasn't you, right? No. They did it. They did. Must have been Stephen because they did a thing called Recipe Wrestling. And it was two guys. They came out. They did a recipe. How it was a it was a cooking show. But needed to say it wasn't you. No. Next question. <laughs> now I can sleep. Thank right. you. Um, your uh, your character in um, Jurassic Park made the Dilophosaurus dinosaur a household name. Uh, before being cast in the movie, did you know what a Dilophosaurus was, and what was your reaction to know, finding out you're going to be eaten by it? I well, first of all, I read the book, you know, and the book is very different from the movie because the book, uh, uh, you know, uh, Nedry gets his head crunched by a dinosaur, which picks him up and crunches his head, and I thought, hmm, I wonder how they're going to do that. And then I see the dinosaur that's going to get me, you know, and it's a German Shepherd-sized dinosaur. I'm thinking, hey, <laughs> you know, I, I can take care of this guy. And then, then the throat fan comes out, and uh, the guy across the street from me now, a, a, a person who lives across the street from me, was the guy who shot me in the face with the dyed black KY jelly out of an air <laughs> rifle. And he held an air rifle, like, about, you know, two feet from my face and said, if you blink... We'll do it again. <laughs> and I had to turn to camera, and, and then it hit me. So, anyway. No, Dilophosaurus, by the way. I don't think anybody knew what a Dilophosaurus was. I think the paleontologists dug up the, the you know, Dilophosaurus. And now, if we got a, a better replica of the Dilophosaurus, it would probably have feathers. Ooh. Off to the back. So on the end of Dominion there, Dodson, spoiler alert, gets eaten by the same Dilophosaurus. Did you watch the movie? Was there some schadenfreude there for you? <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I mean, the minute I was out of the movie, you know, I was depressed. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but no, I, yes, I did, I, I did watch the movie, but I, I don't feel like there was any comeuppance feeling for Dodson. <laughs> Let's go over here. Uh, Wayne, thank you for coming. Have you been to Pittsburgh before? That's question yes. one. And then question two is, lifelong Seinfeld fan, while you were filming and on the set, any pranksters, who, who are the pranksters on the set? Any pranks that you could release to the crowd here? Any, any insights as to how it was working outside of Seinfeld while filming it? Well, you know, one of the things about Seinfeld for me was every, every time we would shoot, you know, on Tuesday night or Thursday night, um, it felt like a Broadway opening. Everything, there's, there's a degree of pressure when something is that good. The, when we would come to the table for a table read, and we'd laugh our asses off. And it was from the table read. And I've been on bad shows where you sit at the table, and there's usually somebody in the distance going, ha, 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 ha. You know? <laughs> These were really funny. And so the... The aspect of doing it was you, you knew pretty soon that you were doing something good. And the fun was in trying not to blow it, trying to, and working with each other to get timing runs and patterns that turned into a bigger laugh. You know, um, it, it's serious work doing comedy. It's strange. You find there's more uh, ribbing each other and having fun on like murder shows and things with blood and you know scary things because you need the relief but when you're laughing all day you don't need a lot of extra <laughs> let's shoot to the back over this side hello Newman hello. <laughs> so um, I've been watching Seinfeld with my family since I was like four years old and at this point in my life all we talk about is Seinfeld and it's like just our form of communication are you in therapy I wish <laughs> I probably should be 
Um, but I have to ask, what, do you have a favorite line from Seinfeld? Because we quote your lines all the time, so I'm just wondering, do you have a favorite line or Newman moment? From well, yourself? you know, I, I I really love the oh the humanity moment of, of the uh, you know the truck bursting into flames. I I just think the idea of Seinfeld is that there are references to all kinds of things within the zeitgeist. And you, the reason why you can watch Seinfeld over and over again is there's little nuggets that you pick up every now and then that you didn't realize were even there. Uh, it's because you've got very smart comedy writers who are writing for themselves. They're not writing for you. So if you happen to catch the joke, you feel lucky. And that's the Seinfeld experience to me. So uh, I hate to say this, but the whole Hello Newman thing, was that written and then just kind of grew? I mean, or was it like in the script that like he... Well, Jerry, Jerry did the, you know, uh, I did the hello, Jerry, and then he did the pause. He did the hello, Newman. And then it just kind of took off. It was not an intentional, you know, deal. So That's what makes it so good. It was organic. Yeah. Way in the back. Hello, Dennis Nedry. How are you? <laughs> hey. I have two questions in the one. Uh, you may have answered this already. I just got here, but number one, what was it like working with the Stan Winston animatronic of the Dilophosaurus? And two, what was it like working with Richard Attenborough, Bob Peck, Samuel L. Jackson, and Steven uh, Spielberg? What, what was that experience like? The experience of working with Spielberg was somewhat daunting because, you know, you uh, you realize you're working at, with somebody at the top of the business and at any given moment they can, you know, find you out as a fraud. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but um, the experience of the Stan Winston side, the technology side, you know, I said, like, in, I, talking to Michael Crichton was part of it, but then walking onto the set that is the uh, control room for Jurassic Park. It's a sub, it's a two story set. The floor that you're on is the second story. Underneath it are the uh, machines from Sun Microsystems, which were operating all of the panels above. And there's a garage down there for the Raptors. The Raptors are all sitting there dead, waiting. So there's like five raptors below that you walk by as you're going upstairs to get on the set. Uh, and just seeing the intricacy of all of the stuff that's been made, you know, is the only thing that would beat it is if I could get on Star Trek. I would have enjoyed that. But, you know, being inside all that stuff is amazing. Amazing. Question right down front. Hi. Hi. Uh, two, quite, two parts. First, what was it like sparring with Richard Attenborough in that scene? And also, what's the story of the, the little gift guy? You know, it was just, it was just something to... Uh, I didn't even have to do it, you know, really, because just do the voiceover and then they do the frozen thing. And it was the idea that Dennis was the ultimate prick. You know, I mean, he, he was somebody who you couldn't get into his computer and you couldn't do anything with him and nobody knew he was larcenous they just thought he was lazy you know uh as far as turning around and being mean to richard attenborough on hello you know it does preclude you becoming a really close friend <laughs> you know i don't come back later and, well actually I, no it was um it was pretty amazing because uh, getting getting notes from Steven Spielberg on how to play with Dickie Attenborough, and you're going, yeah, this works. <laughs> it was pretty pretty wonderful experience. Okay, right in the back again. So ending a, an iconic show like Seinfeld is almost impossible. So I, I'm kind of curious, what are your thoughts about the finale? And I'll admit, I was kind of hoping you and Jerry would wind up in a cell together there at the end. Uh, well, <laughs> I'm, uh, I think I'm like the rest of the public as far as the finale goes. I don't think you could end that show in a way that would work, you know? And the idea of doing a retrospective is, uh, winds up feeling like a clip show, you know? So I think that they tried 
to give tribute to all of the people who had walked through that set, all the great performances, all the great people. And it didn't quite land in the way that they wanted. But what Larry wanted to do was, was show that these people were not deserving of any glory. <laughs> you know, <laughs> he wanted them to, them to have the worst time possible. And as a concept, that works. But I don't know if it works as a finale. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Okay. We're right over here. Uh, did you have any work on Curb Your Enthusiasm? Uh, only uh, in the Seinfeld reunion-esque right. deal. Okay, let's do a question right down here. Hi. Did um, everybody on Seinfeld really get along? I mean, were you like no. really, really good friends? Yeah. No. Two I people hated each other, and one actually shot the other one in the leg. <laughs> <laughs> I won't tell which or who, but no, yes. We got along, uh, like on the set, you know, I, I think that you prioritize when you're doing uh, something like this. I've had situations where you come into uh, a show and you've had even a conflict with somebody in the past and you let it go, you know, because, um, and also when you're working with people and they're really good and it's really funny and you feel like a, a, a team doing something important, you know, you gotta stay together, you have to. Um, it was really important stuff. We felt like it was important. And question right here. Did you learn any good dance moves off of Dirty Dancing? No. <laughs> I, I, you know, they, they gave me this one dance move that I had to do. And then later, years later, I'm um, working on Broadway. I'm in a musical. Don't know why that happened, but I, it's, it's something I tried to start doing. The choreographer says, it's just a simple flea step, you know, flea step, hop, hop, flea hop, flea hop, flea hop. And I'm like, I'm not a dancer. Uh, and what, what the story from Dirty Dancing, which is not known, is that all of those great young dancers were not union, and they got paid almost nothing. So the, the people that, you know, you remember the most, uh, you know, were, were doing it selflessly in some ways, but they had a great time because we were all in this one lodge in, uh, in Virginia, and all those young people were in there together. <laughs> Got time for a few more questions. Did you ever do any PSA work for the post office? I did, I, I, did a, um, I did a thing for what was happening to the post office. It was um, because the, uh, when the, post, the current postmaster general took over, the idea was to dismantle the post office was to make it harder for them to succeed, was to take overtime away from all the mail carriers, was to give them uh, schedules that they couldn't keep. And so it was really, really a rough road, you know? And I got a lot of messages from people who were mail carriers, and I did a PSA for the Postal Service, you know, because I felt like it was important that over the years I've come to respect them, especially those who come to my door, and I go, hi, <laughs> I like you. <laughs> Let's get a question away in the back. Let's do two or three more. Uh, yeah, what is it like to have the who cares or nobody cares scene from Jurassic Park return online as like a meme? Is that a surreal experience? Or? Yeah, what's, what, you know, who would have thought that specific, you know, would become a, a, a deal? But I'll take it. I'm, I'm writing it a lot on, on photos. <laughs> Uh, yeah, question right, right there. Yeah. You're going to be headed back to your table to sign after this? Yes. So please keep that in mind. We've got time for just two more questions. Pleasure to speak with you, sir. I was just curious. You kind of no. partially answered it already, but like, are there any franchises that you would, if given the chance, love to work on? Well, uh, yeah. I, I, I mean, I, I'm right for this place. It would be uh, anything that any other geek would enjoy. Uh, you know, I, I enjoy uh, sci-fi franchises. I enjoy, I, you know... Um, and are there comedies that I would like to be on? Yes. Right now, I would have, uh, The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel, I would have loved to have been on just because of the era of comedy. Uh, there are plenty of things that I would, I would like to do, but I feel like I've gotten my share of really nice stuff, so I can't complain. And one last one way in the back. So, so, so when the making of Space Space Jam, 
what is your f- favorite scene? Um, it's hard for me to say in Space Jam because the experience of it was not really while doing it. The experience of it was seeing it afterwards because they, you know, really uh, Space Jam is an animated film with live action in it. It's not a live action film where they have some animation. So you're really acting as a voice artist. And the things you're doing, like I'm doing a fall in space, but in the cartoon, there'll be a cloud of dust, there'll be a doorway, there'll be all kinds of stuff, you know? So it's very hard for me to pick my favorite scene because I didn't really experience it. Well, let's squeeze in one more. more. Who's got it? This better be the best question. So if it's not the best question, and it better not start with Hello Newman. Okay, good. We're clear. Could you please tell me a little of the experiences being Don Orville on Third Rock from the Sun? Ah, uh, yeah. Well, you know, this is the strangest thing. Terry Turner, who was the creator with his wife Bonnie of, of um, Third Rock from the Sun and then that 70s show, I went to school with him at the University of Georgia. He was a graduate student leaving because I was an undergraduate coming in. And we did a play together. And we became friends. And I would see him over the years. I would see him and Bonnie in New York when they were uh, the head writers on Saturday Night Live. And I was like, "Eh, how you doing? I'm waiting table. Oh, you're on SNL. That's good. Uh, And then years later, uh, I'm on Radford at CBS Radford doing Seinfeld. And they're starting up on on, uh, Third Rock from the Sun. We ran into each other. And he said, you know what? We would like to write a show for you. And I'm like, what? We would like to write a show for you, but we, we can't for years. Would you come over to Third Rock and be on Third Rock for a couple for a few years until we can do it? I'm like, well, yes. And the character, since Terry and I both went to the University of Georgia, and we were in Georgia, we grew up in, in the Atlanta area. There was a kids program called uh, the Popeye Club, and the guy who ran it was a guy named Officer Don. And he had a puppet that was a dragon named Orville. And so the character became Officer Don Orville. (laughs) And it was one of the best experiences I had. uh, That cast was so great. Uh, Worked with Jane Curtin and and, uh, and John Lithgow is a friend uh, to this day. We are are good friends. Um, And Joey Gordon-Levitt, you know, as as a boy, as a great actor, as a young kid, and he had great parents. It just was a really good experience. Yeah, that's a good way to end. That is, it's a good experience. <laughs> Wayne Thank Knight, you. you know what to do. He'll be headed back to his table. <laughs> Give it up. Thank you, Wayne. Hi, fans. We hope you enjoyed that panel, and if you're feeling inspired by Wayne's performances, you can show your love with some great shirts from 80stees.com. And coupon code FSNIGHT will get you 30% off your next order. So head over to 80stees.com for some great savings. See you next time. Hi, this is Aaron Ashmore, and you are watching Phantom Spotlight. Be sure to like, share, and subscribe like, like now. Oh, and have fun and follow your fandom.